Hello again, this is Alan Wolf from Your Source News here at uh, Summit 2022 in Las Vegas at the Expo uh, part of the show. And I'm sitting here with Michael Poza, who heads up our furniture tech. Furniture technology source. Thank you. That's why you <laughs> to fill in the gaps for me. Thank you. Furniture. Te te I can't pronounce technology. FTS. Well, I, yeah, FTS for sure. Thank you very much. Uh, which leads to our first question, Michael. First of all, how are you? How are you doing? I'm doing great. You having a good great show. show. Oh, yeah, great great show. show. Yeah. Like like Ed Sullivan, a really big show. Really <laughs> <laughs> biggest you've ever seen. No, it's actually a phenomenal show. Lots of energy, um, especially on the furniture and mattress side, which you know, remains to be one of our fastest growing categories. So we're we're excited. So I'm going to ask you. A, a stupid question, even though there are no stupid questions, but um, there are some. the the the, uh, the name that I can't pronounce, furniture technology source. Boom. That's a lot of that's a lot of syllables. What is that all about? Yeah, that's why we go with FTS usually. Okay. Um, so the furniture technology source, um, <coughs> you're starting to see that that name out there. I think we announced it um, at the uh, convention last year. It was kind of in its infancy at that point, but now we're rocking and rolling, Alan. Uh, basically. Uh, how I would describe furniture technology sources, it's a division, a lane, a focus group, if you will, within brand source. So it's not necessarily its own uh, new group, um, it's kind of a group within a group there where we've had furniture dealers for a long time um, express to us, hey, you know, there's not really a place for us to live in the group. You know, we obviously have a number of regions, we have the power dealer side, we have all these other things, where would a furniture dealer live? So we said, all right, we need to invest in technology. We know that, our retailers have told us that, and then we need to invest also in networking, and how are we gonna do that? We need to dedicate some resources, and we need to dedicate a division or a lane or a channel of our company. So we've created Furniture Technology Source. The technology is because that's the majority, arguably, of the value that we're providing the furniture dealers as a group, mm -hmm. is through the technology side. Many of our dealers have told us we're joining the group for technology. Obviously, there's a lot we do um, for furniture dealers, but technology being such a key focus, we decided to roll with that name as we're, uh, you know, reinvesting and enhancing our focus on this channel. Speaking with some of the dealers in your in your in your FTS organization, uh, it seems like there's not a whole lot, or, or there hadn't been until now, a whole lot out there that addresses, at least in terms of the digital world, the you know the problems and challenges that uh, they face. Furniture different than appliances uh, in some ways. Um, there's a lot of similarities uh, between between furniture and appliances and how they go to market, uh, the retailers. But there are some key differences. And uh, furniture is very fragmented, the industry. There are hundreds of relevant uh, vendors out there, thousands, uh, tens of thousands, if you look at the, the broader international landscape of furniture manufacturing. So there's multiple markets throughout the year, trade shows throughout the year. So it's, it's, it's a little different. Um, and being so fragmented, so many vendors, so many retailers, there's probably, you know, you hear different numbers, there's probably three or four times the number of furniture dealers out there. We probably drove drove past a few of them on the way to the hotel here from the airport. There's a lot. There's a lot of furniture stores, there's a lot of mattress stores, probably upwards of 20,000 uh, just in this country, not even including uh, our friends in Canada. And then, as I mentioned, there's thousands of furniture vendors. So how do you... How do you put your arms around How do you like put that? your arms around all of that? And then how do you become a resource for helping them go to market, capture their share of voice in their local market um, with all that competition, with all that fragmentation on the vendor side? How do you get all that data from the vendors so we can even get our products out there in front of the consumer? It is difficult. Um, and it is entirely what we're focusing on. Yeah, yeah. Do you have any sense of uh, sales volume? compared to the appliance industry, just to give us a sense of uh, the size differential. Actually, you, you probably know the appliance numbers better than I, but the, the furniture industry in the U.S. is about a $100 billion industry. Wow, so I, I would say three times the size of the appliance business. That sounds about right, yeah. it's uh, now f you, have to, you have to think about it this way. So appliances, laundry, kitchen. Primarily two rooms, right? Furniture across the entire house. So if you look at the average spend on appliances, Take, take maybe ultra luxury out for a moment. If you look at the average spend on appliances relative to the average spend for a home on furniture, it's multiples. Yeah. So um, it tends to be something that is also a very emotional purchase. Not that appliances isn't, but it tends to be an emotional purchase. It's a fashion-oriented purchase. Trends change quickly. Every 
Norm take COVID aside, there hasn't been as many product introductions in the last couple of years, but normally every year, every two years, there's pretty significant shifts in the, the trend out there. Yeah. We, we've been covering the industry through your source news, and too many of our stories are all about inventory and supply chain issues, getting things over from Asia, maybe moving production to Mexico. Have, has there been any, any kind of update that you're hearing from the vendors, any kind of news you can share about improvements or things loosening up? As far as availability. Yeah, I mean, I wish I wish I could be the bearer of better news, but we're in this for a while. Um, Vietnam is is the number one producer of, of uh, furniture uh, globally, and um, if you've been well, if you've been following Vietnam at all, uh, the whole country has been shutting down time and time and time. So again. they're they're still ravaged by by COVID. I, it's been it's it hasn't happened now. I think, gosh, I can't remember the last time they had a shut down but uh, it's, it's been a little while now so we've caught up mm -hmm. um, but it has been extremely painful over the last couple of years I mean you've seen the container issue I'm sure you know the, the pricing of the containers availability of containers um, has been a disaster so uh, I'm not saying appliances has been easy or any category yeah. take take, take car, car dealerships aside. yeah <laughs> Nothing, nothing, uh, very few things have been easy from a supply chain logistics standpoint over the last couple of years, but furniture's been hit especially hard for those two reasons. One, it is very much a uh, Vietnam, China based situation as it relates to the sourcing of the product. Um, not that there aren't domestic producers, there are, and there's some big ones, uh, as well as up in Canada, but Asia dominates so strongly there in terms of the production side, it's in demand just skyrocketing and then staying there um, has just created that perfect storm. I will say this, just a touch of a, a glimmer, I should say, of hope. Um, we went to the recent uh, market. I was going to ask you, but you were just yeah. here a couple, a few weeks uh, ago. Yeah, a month ago. <laughs> <laughs> Back. Back. But uh, so we went, uh, we met with over 100 vendors. So our merchandising team is a team of five on the furniture side. That's, that's significantly expanded from what it was, which is one person forever. So now we've got five folks out there, and they're responsible for meeting with the vendors, um, ensuring that our open lines of communication, that we're getting the data in a timely fashion, that we're understanding when they discontinue product, when they're introducing product, getting all that data in our systems for the benefit of our retailers that are on our website platform. So all that preamble aside, we met with over 100 vendors, um, well over actually, in, in Las Vegas, and almost to the one, uh, we started. To, we heard the, the feedback that they're starting to unwind their back orders. Okay. Their back orders are no longer building and lengthening. There were a couple of exceptions, but almost to the one, their back orders are starting to unwind. Over the last couple of years, that has not been something I've heard. It's just been getting progressively worse and worse. It started with two weeks delays, four, three months, six months, some over a year, and it just continued to get worse. Um, it's getting better. It's getting better. You know, no one can predict the future. We don't know, you know, variants or, you know, obviously uh, the horrible situation in, in uh, Eastern Europe right now. And um, that's, uh, who knows where that's going to go. Yeah. It's like, we can't predict the future, but the trend is looking positive as it relates to slowly working out and moving out of the supply chain situation. In your discussions with vendors, what's their, how are, they, how are they receiving you know the concept of FTS? Are they, uh, how is the reception? We're really just getting them? it out there. Um, <coughs> so obviously the brand source name is well known in the industry. Um, being a 50 year old buying group, being in the furniture industry a long time. Although just the last couple of years, just stratosphere and growth. So vendors that had never heard of brand source before are now saying, oh, brand source, I know that group. Oh, you're in brand source uh, to a retailer. So we're really starting to see some encouraging things on the, um, uh, you know, some of the smaller and newer vendors that are out there. You know, that said, we're really just getting, <coughs> excuse me, we're really just getting the FTS name out there. So I would say awareness, uh, admittedly, is probably a little low right now. That's why we're doing things like this. Mm -hmm. So um, we're just getting it out there. But they really like the concept. Um, I, you know, vendors, uh, manufacturers that come to our events, especially, <coughs> or that we meet with at the various markets throughout the year. I think we're doing. I think we're doing a really good job, actually, at getting the message out that hey, our group is focused on helping your customers, the retailers, digitally. Um, to access new shoppers, to to better market to their existing customers, etc. And going back to the logistical challenges you cited, what what's the best advice you can give to our, our furniture members as far as planning the year ahead? Yeah, and the, navigating the, the retail the, the retail landscape. 
Yeah. Uh, it's a complicated question. <laughs> it's easy, not easy for me to get out either. I'll say, I'll say first of all, um, I'll go from kind of the end of it to the beginning. Uh, at the very end of it, I would recommend you have to message what is in stock. Believe it or not, two years arguably into COVID here, into the pandemic, we are still seeing just massive uh, <clears throat> data that would imply that people are still shopping by in stock. What's available? Um, you heard in uh, Jim's speech, or we heard in Jim's speech, and Risto's uh, speech a couple days ago, or maybe it was yesterday morning, um, time's a blur at these things, um, that we took share from national retailers. Okay. Now, in furniture, there's not a lot of national retailers necessarily, in, in, except for Ikea, Pottery Barn, you know, those kind of guys. Mm -hmm. um, Ashley Home Stores is, is a national retailer, but outside of that, um, there's not a lot of nationals. But where we did take share um, is from some of those huge power regionals, I would call them, and, and, and from the nationals. And we, while e-commerce grew and the online players grew because the whole industry grew, um, there's some data to imply that we also took some share there. And it's because the website messages that in-stock, uh, the website communicates that in-stock messaging. So shoppers, consumers, they're still shopping by what's available. So yeah. that would be my first thing. So the first thing you should absolutely do is message, get your get your message out there of what is available so that you're selling what's in stock. Otherwise, you're gonna get into a situation where, first of all, you may not see that shopper. They may never engage with you because they'll engage somewhere else where they can see what's in stock because they're going to less than, fewer than two stores now mm -hmm. uh, is the data. 1.8, I believe it is. So furniture shoppers are going to fewer than two stores and mattress. Mm. So they're going to pick a store where they get the sense that there's a pretty healthy in stock inventory there. Even if it's not, the, the, the shopper doesn't know that it's not what you would maybe typically have. They don't know that you're 60% in stock, but they see in stock messaging all over your website. They see it in your advertisements. They know that you have product available. So that would be my first recommendation. As it relates to the supplier side on the front end, yeah. You really just have to keep that open line of communication going with the vendor at all times. Follow up on your orders, make sure that you are in front of your manufacturers all the time because we're in a situation right now where the manufacturers are allocating goods. That's happened, you know, I come from a appliance electronics background in a past life. Um, Lines and electronics manufacturers have been allocating goods as long as I can remember, yeah. um, especially certain times throughout the year. That's a fairly new concept to the furniture industry. Oh, really? So that's been a sea change almost to the mentality of how a furniture retailer runs their business. They can't just order what they saw at a market anymore. It may be eight months till they can get it. So they see something, they love it, they say, all right, I'm going to put this in our assortment. All right, you can get it in eight months. Okay, well, I want it in eight months. And then you stay in touch with that manufacturer. You make sure, it's not always gonna happen, but you just make sure you stay in front of them, you stay in front of your rep. Ideally, you can talk to someone at the manufacturer. That's why I think it's still important to come to these and to come to the markets, so that you can get FaceTime with the people that work at the manufacturers, not maybe just your local sales territory rep. Yeah. Because oftentimes those are independent reps that maybe maybe don't have any say really in how product is allocated sometimes. So staying in touch with them, making sure that you're always in front of them, squeak wheel gets the grease. It's not always going to happen, but you have to stay in front of the vendors, otherwise you're not going to get product allocated. And then, and this is you know a touchy subject sometimes, I think it's a time to, to really reevaluate if the vendors that you've been partnering with are still good partners of yours. Um, and if not, Maybe it's time to take a look at somebody else. If yes, then it's time to go all in with that vendor because we will come out of this and vendors that have been taking care of you, they are going to just experience phenomenal growth as we come out of it. Those that maybe haven't, I think they're gonna struggle as they come out of this. So um, not all manufacturers have, have handled this evenly. There's been various strategies of how we handle the supply chain situation. There have been some that have eliminated dealers, that, and then there's some that have continued to add throughout this, and uh, they just have, uh, you know, so it's all over the place. So just take a look at your partners, um, reevaluate where things sit. Every market is different in furniture. That's another difference for appliances. You know, certain areas uh, products sell differently depending on you know, trends in that area and the preferences. But just uh, really reevaluate. Uh, it takes some time to reevaluate if the vendors are taking care of you or not. Um, and then see where that takes you. We're happy to always make introductions if you're looking potentially for new manufacturers, if you're looking to get into new categories. Or oh, looking to get into furniture altogether. Looking to get into furniture altogether. We can help you there. Um, you know, obviously we have a lot of good vendor partners here as part of Brand Source. 
Um, we have those conversations all the time so that we, from our chair, are pushing the manufacturers to have policies that are advantageous to independent retail. It's been challenging, I'll admit, over the last couple of years, but we're making strides. I saved the toughest question for last. All right. Obviously, there's a lot of moving parts in the marketplace and in the world today. It's impossible to see ahead more than a, a couple of hours. But uh, what's your outlook for the balance of 2022? Balance of the year? So, we already talked on the supply side. I think uh, when you, I'll just touch real quick again on that. Again, not an economist, don't have a PhD, but I do. we do talk to a lot of vendors. And um, putting all of those independent opinions and factoids together, it feels like by the end of the year, we're going to be looking pretty good from a supply, from a supply side. We won't be fully caught up. But as we go into 2023, I think you'll start to be able to make normal business decisions again, meaning selecting new products, knowing, having a better handle on when they're coming instead of the ambiguity we're dealing with these days. Focusing more on your traditional tactics of expanding your market as opposed to just catching up with the existing demand. Um, that's going to be key. So I think by the time we get to the end of the year, we're going to be having some of those conversations of, hey, how do we access new shoppers? How do we expand our trade area? Should we look at new categories? Should we look into you know, new products? Should we introduce new lines? Is this line performing? Is that line performing? Right now, almost everything's performing. It just sells if it's available. Um, so I think we're going to get into a lot more of those conversations towards the end of the year. In terms of numbers and consumer demand, and consumer consumer demand can you keep that base going? So far we haven't seen, uh, we haven't, I don't think we've hit that ceiling yet with, with uh, shoppers. But there's some evidence that maybe we're getting close, um, especially at the high end. But um, the furniture industry probably was due for a little bit of inflation, yeah. to be candid. I mean, we were selling 399 sofas 20 years ago, still are, maybe not as much the last year. So I think we were due for a little bit of inflation, but we may be pressing up against that ceiling here where shoppers say enough. There's a little bit of data that would back that up. Um, I think we'll end the year about flat with 2021. And 2021 though was better year. supercharged. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, better year. So even coming it would out- way, be way over, We would still be way over 19. Though. Exactly, it's coming. so flat, flat is the new good. That's my prediction. <laughs> Sounds good. Michael, thank you very much for stopping by. Thank you for your time and continued success with the new progress. Thank you. New program. Appreciate it.